Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mike Chaprari from SJC Drums. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Bart. I appreciate you having me on. Totally, man. Um, so this is like new and uncharted territory here on the show because you are the most modern brand. You've been SJC has been a company for 20 years, which is by far, you know, that's that's not you didn't start, you know, yesterday. But um I think it's it's important to bring on these new, newer companies such as SJC. And you're the first one um, because you guys have, I, I would say you've kind of changed the the landscape of drumming a little bit um, and been really just consistent with the quality. So um, I'm excited to have you on and uh, and and talk about the the newer generation of, of drum companies. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I appreciate, again, you having us on the show. And it's it, that's really special for us to be the the first of the the new modern drum companies. And uh, I appreciate the kind words for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and I want to thank real quick. I usually do it at the end, but he, he really hooked it up for us. Nicholas Angelini um, of Whale City Drums, um, which uh, he was the drummer for a Wilhelm Scream, which I always loved that band. Um, yeah, dude, Nick. Yeah. Shout out, Nick. Thank you for hooking Bart and I up. Um, he was at our factory a few weeks ago and he mentioned uh, that he was talking to you or, you know, listening to your podcast and stuff. So thank you, Nick. And shout out to Whale City. Nick's a great dude. I love Wilhelm Scream. Love them for the whole 20 years of SJC being a company. And uh, Nick was one of the first drummers to play our drums. So kind of cool, full circle moment uh, to connect with him and now be on the podcast. Absolutely. That's honestly, that's how I've gotten. I, I always tell people like, when they suggest stuff, they'll some sometimes people say you must get a ton of suggestions. And I'm like, yeah, but it's cool to like, that's what keeps it fresh to hear what people like. So um, cool, man. Well, um, yeah, Mike, why don't we jump in and, um, and really just start at the beginning of the company? Um, which, again, it's, you know, you're not that you're a young guy, the company's pretty young. So um, just take us back to the beginning here. Well, how did it all start? Cool. Yeah. So we, we started really humble beginnings. You know, we were kids, legit, like preteens starting to play the drums and just really getting into music. My brother and I did not come from, you know, we don't come from a musical family and somehow we both got into music. I got into drums at nine years old. He was playing the saxophone and keyboard and learning, you know, notes and scales and how to read and write music. And it was this kind of perfect harmony of just two brothers who we come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. Our grandfather owned his own businesses. Our dad uh, had his own business for a long time. And so we were just always around like hustle and getting into music was kind of the, 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 the touching point for us to really begin what is now SJC Drums. We didn't mean to do it. It was really my brother just messing around in our backyard, spray painting, you know, like most cool things. And there's yeah. a lot of drum hobbyists that are doing this now. We were, we were just like them, just doing it, spray painting hardware. My brother would rewrap kits and recut bearing edges. And mm. this is like prior to even MySpace being out. No social media. The internet was was a thing, obviously, but it wasn't. You know, we still had phone books, and and you call people on the telephone, and uh, we just started you know, hacking away at building drums for fun. And my brother, Scott, eventually took a corner of our grandmother's basement who lived next door. So our offices were in our bedrooms and our workshop was next door. And we just started hustling, man. Like we would print flyers for our company at Kinko's and like pass them out at local hardcore shows at VFW halls and things like that. And <laughs> yeah, it was, it is, and always has been all about the connection with the drummer and the artist and what they want and who they want to be and what they want to sound like and us supporting them and making their drum come to life, but also just being their friend and making sure that they're covered, whether they're in a studio or on tour all the time. And um, yeah, just networking really got us uh, started early. I was like 15, just going to shows, like I said, and connecting with drummers. Now, what year, what year was, was, was that, you know, original, you know, was it SJC at that point? And what year was that? Yeah, it definitely wasn't SJC. It was probably like 1998, I, I like legit, like okay. 1998, 1999. I was 14. My brother was 15. Um, just, you know, nothing serious at all. Obviously, we weren't like keeping track of inventory and having accounting, yeah, you know, yeah. but it, things like that. Like we were just straight up um, messing around, uh, mostly my brother at that point. But I was out like kind of like pimping out like, hey, my brother does this. I thought it was so cool. 
Um, that is cool. <laughs> and 2000 is when it really started. Like he graduated high school and um, went off to college and he went to uh, the University of Southern Maine, I think, for uh, for music education. He wanted to be a teacher. Um, mm-hmm. So again, he was way into, we're very different people. He was way into reading music and learning about bearing edges and different ply configurations. And I was in a punk rock band, didn't know how to read music, you know, learned it a little bit in high school, but um, but I was out there at punk rock shows, like just being interested in what crazy color combinations we could come up with. So, yeah, um, yeah, it was a cool, it was a cool, just uh, fun hobby for, for the first, you know, five or six years, like 2004, 2005 is when it really started getting serious for us. And that, I mean, man, that like, um, so I'm 30, so you're, you're a little, a little before me, but that that time there and my brothers around uh in between our ages there where he was playing more in that like hardcore punk pop punk you know era that that was that time yeah. really i mean that was like a golden time for all of that um so which which i think is you know there's a lot of players of sjc who are in that world so that's kind of foreshadowing but and you said your brother's name is scott correct correct yep okay cool um all right, so you guys are messing around. You're building kits for other people, right? Or are you mainly building your own, you know, your own drums for your own gigs? Yeah, it, it got it got busy really fast. Like it was it was just my brother building his own stuff, and and he'd find drums on Craigslist and take them apart and and refinish them. And a couple of friends from high school, like his buddy Nick Smith, uh, in high school. Then when he went to to college, he had a few friends that um that that got kits from him. Evan, dude, I remember all these people's names from like way back in the day. And I remember exactly what they got. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, just, just for friends. And and I was out there going to warp tour, sneaking backstage, like trying to talk to drummers. And we were making drums for all those bands that were, that were up and coming, that were eventually going to, going to pretty much blow up and take, and take our name with them, you know, panic at the disco and yeah. gym class heroes. And the Academy is, I was just going to these shows, but then on the other side, on the hardcore side, like, Kurt Ballou from Converge got drums for his studio, God City, here in Massachusetts. And um, Ben Kohler from Converge and Streetlight Manifesto. And again, Wilhelm Scream. All of these bands were like, you know, I was such a huge fan of these bands. So I would reach out to them online. Um, I'd find, you know, this is again, pre-social media. So it was pretty easy to find a band's Hotmail G, uh, or Gmail account on their website. Yeah, probably, probably Hotmail at that point. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, I'm just blind emailing these people and they're like, oh, that sounds cool. Custom drums. It wasn't like a massive thing back then, especially here in Massachusetts. So yeah. we just started making drums and then all these bands are out on the road with an SJC logo that we created to just be like, yeah, we, we have a business, I guess. And it's my brother's initials. And I thought just putting the oval with a star on it could look cool. And uh, it was all just a happy accident that it, that it got, that it got serious and we became an actual company. Yeah, that's awesome. So in that time, it just jumped from like, okay, we need to like, I mean, but man, you became a business then. So obviously you're like getting a tax ID number and you're like doing business things where <laughs> I'm sure at first you weren't like, let's, you know, make sure we save enough for taxes. Yeah, no way, man. I I didn't even know what to do there. I remember my brother, we, we were both living at home at the time still, and he was at the kitchen table one night and he's like, yo, you got to help me get all these receipts like oh, organized and like in a spreadsheet because we have to pay our tax. I'm like, what the heck does that mean, dude? Like what? And yeah, we, yeah. we, we luckily had a lot of people around us. Again, my family, my dad helped us a lot. Um, my, uh, my buddy Brian, who was very involved in the company at the beginning, his his parents owned a trophy, like a, a screen printing and trophy engraving business. So they helped me a lot on on all that stuff, getting a tax ID number and all that. And um, yeah. yeah, it was dude, it, it was and you know it always has been just trial by fire, learn, mess up, learn again, fix it, and it's just that's how that's how we've done it. Yeah, I mean, I think the the use of all of your circle and your connections is a really important thing where i mean some people maybe out there may not have you know someone to do their taxes and all this but i feel like if you look hard enough you can find these connections and it's really important i mean you guys probably maybe it's fair to say you wouldn't be here if you didn't have all of those people helping you 
Dude, a hundred, a hundred percent. Even, even legitimately today, like my mom will come in and ha- and help assemble when we have a lot going on to help us get ahead. Or my dad yeah. helped us move our factory, and um, you know, buddies from town. My dad's neighbor helping us move. Like this literally happened two months ago, and this is our twentieth year of business. And we've always relied on just people that care about us as individuals and the company to help us. And you're right. Like not everybody has those connections. Um, I'm very, you know, we were very fortunate and I'm very fortunate to have these people. Um, and it helps that we do something cool or we make drums for rad bands. So like, you know, we can return the favor to somebody pretty easily. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's about just building that network and that circle obviously easier without COVID, but you know, you could go to your local yeah. coffee shop or make friends, you know, there's always ways to, to, to uh, trade services or have somebody, you know, um, do you a favor and you just pay them back later, buy them a coffee or something like this clever way sure. to go about it for sure. Yeah. And I mean, hard work is at the core of everything. I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, we just, with all of this stuff, it's like with doing drum history for me and, and, and it's just like, it, it's there's no easy way about it and i guarantee you probably you know you're obviously in the same boat um now you mentioned i mean so there's some about sjc where like the endorsers are really really like most brands are really important but like there is a vibe to sjc i mean there is like it's like i don't want to say new school but it's very modern and it's very like god i don't know it's just like the people you guys endorse love the brand and are just so happy to like represent it and um i mean you've got some great drummers on your lineup let's let's back up when did it first start to be like um you're getting these bigger and bigger and bigger drummers where they're they're coming to you to play um who who was maybe the first obviously in that you know hardcore punk screamo pop punk world they were coming on but when was there like a wow, this dude or girl is massive. Yeah, that's an awesome question. And uh, I appreciate, you know, you noticing that vibe and and, uh, and talking about it. it. That is something that we've, we pride ourselves on from day one. Like I mentioned, we, we make custom drums and we're turning drummers ideas into a reality that then they're going to go create music on and tour the world. And they're going to have their image. People are going to see them and go, oh, wow, that dude has a certain look about his drum set. Like I, I kind of, understand that drummer a little bit more and his his vibe and his thing and that's really cool and that's really important you know the early 2000s there were obviously only a few custom drum companies out there and obviously me being a drum nerd i was um, i am and was a fan of all of them of all companies but something that i noticed that was missing in the drum community was a community and Mm -hmm. it just seemed like a business and i didn't want to do that i always again having a grandpa and my dad running their businesses, watching them and learning from them. I'm like, business isn't meant to be nine to five and business isn't meant to be Monday through Friday. Businesses and a family business and being an entrepreneur means you're on all the time and you have to be passionate about it to get through those ups and downs. And this hobby turned into a business allowed my brother and I to just not, to to not fear anything and not uh, turn anybody away or, or, or say no. We always welcomed new ideas and, and wacky things like the butcher hoop and putting lights in drums and just crazy yep. stuff to make it really go over the top. And so all of our drummers that play our stuff now have that vibe where they're just like, yo, I play SJC and it's, you know, the drums sound great and they look great, but the people behind it in the company are what I support the most. And that's always yep. been our thing. And we've been extremely lucky making friends with, with such cool drummers um, from early on. And some of the early ones that got us the most stoked were, for me, it was Eric Kane from Strike Anywhere. Um, and uh, my brother, right around the same time, my brother's favorite band uh, is the Aquabats. And we made drums for Ricky, yeah. uh, Ricky yeah. Fitness of the Aquabats. And we learned very quickly right then, we shipped Ricky an acrylic drum set. And my brother had never seen them. And uh, they were about to go on tour. They weren't on tour for a bit. And then they were going on tour probably, I don't even know what year it was, maybe like 2004. And uh, shipped him an acrylic kit. My brother's so stoked. He's going to see him in Boston playing this SJC kit we made him. The bass drum broke, so, uh, shipping it to California. So oh, my brother had Ricky um, like basically tape the drum shell, 
play the first two shows of it because they drove to like Milwaukee and then their second show is in Cleveland, Ohio at the, I think, Agora yeah. Theater. Is that, in, is that? In yeah, Cleveland? yeah. That's yeah, they, yeah. They played there and my brother and I overnighted a new bass drum shell, built it, threw it in my van at the time, drove out overnight and brought the, sh- the drum to them. And we went on tour with the Aquabats for a week. My brother ended up doing lights for them and they slept <laughs> over our house when they played Boston. <laughs> So that's awesome. We realized then like, wow, dude, like we just hustled and and it was fun because like we got to see the Aquabats for two weeks and they slept over our house. But like, wow, that reward was really cool. And that band will we'll always talk about that. And we just learned very quickly, like, all right, you, we, we're not just going to make drums for people. We're This is cool, man. Like we're friends with like the whole band now. And this is rad. Let's see how many bands we can make drums for. Um, and then it really blew up for us in, uh, 2006 when panic at the disco played on the MTV video music mm. boards. Um, I was in a band touring at the time. I, I ended up having to leave the band and I dropped out of, high, of uh, uh, college, um, to focus on the company hundred percent. So it was, it was like 2005 going into 2006. That was like, all right, this is full time. Um, we're, we're moving out of grandma's basement. Let's do this. Yeah. God, that's awesome. I mean, you got to go for it. You got to go um, all the way. And it obviously worked out for you. I mean, that's that's crazy. I can't imagine seeing it on TV. I've heard some other people say like, man, for us, a big moment like GMS was like to see it on. Um, they were like, we saw recently a GMS kit on a um, uh, Miles Davis documentary. And we were like, whoa, and it whoa. continues to happen like that. <laughs> it's, yeah, dude, that's so cool. Yeah, I man, I, I would be stoked to have our drums on a on a Miles, <laughs> Miles Davis uh, documentary. But um, yeah, panic. Yeah, was cool, man. It like we, we I'll never forget that feeling. We were watching it in, in our parents living room and uh, literally across across the backyard was our grandma's house. And we're watching the MTV VMAs and there's the drums we built right next door. Uh, I felt really cool. And, and our, our whole family was supportive, you know, as we grew and more and more drummers were on late night TV and stuff. Like I kind of lost track of it, but my grandma would always text me. She'd be like, Hey, turn it on. You know, your drums are on TV or like somebody would send me a screenshot. It's really Mm, cool. Really gratifying um, thing for sure. That is awesome. Now you kind of mentioned before about doing cool kits and stuff and unique stuff. You guys do some of the most, I would say you do the most out there i mean you obviously do very classic just awesome you know drum sets just great drum sets but you also do some of the most unique extreme like (laughs) out there kits i've ever seen and the first one i remember seeing that i feel like was just like a social media thing for me that i saw was the golf one where it was like there was like the the little hole on the side and it had like a golf ball and it was like a green I just remember seeing that on um, Facebook or Instagram yeah, or something. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, I mean, but that's, it's not like clickbait. That's the wrong word. But it's like you get people to notice you with this crazy stuff. And then they realize, but you have like a foundation under it of really cool drums. Cool. Um, what Talk about that. You're, you're just, you're the, the super out there stuff. Yeah, we love doing that stuff, man. And we... We we pride ourselves on everything and the drums that we build that are classy. We always want to put a little bit of a modern twist and have modern and, and vintage kind of meet in the middle and merge in the middle for a for a really awesome drum set. And we you know most of what we build is that there's a there's a lot of satin stains going out. There's a lot of sixties oyster. You know the, there's there's certain trends that we hit back in the day. It was yep. the glitter stripes. Um, you know, and we'll we obviously build what the customer wants and. You know, social media can be awesome, but it can also be devastating when you see somebody negatively talking about your your passion. But it's like sure. people got to remember, like, yo, we build what the customer wants. We're not we're not just there at the shop every day building what we want and sending it to customers, hoping that they like it or they'll buy it. So yeah. when we have an opportunity, you know, such as Nam or for an artist like Panic at the Disco or a a bigger band that allows us some flexibility in the design, we like to flex a little bit, and so. When the Warp Tour was happening, there was a lot of bands on the Warp Tour that would have this kind of silent battle of who's going to have the most epic kit this summer. And so, yeah, we built we built some wacky stuff, you know, and within our little community at NAMM, you know, Truth or whoever it may be, there was this little like, who's going to show up with the most epic drum set at NAMM? Um, so we'd always go nuts. You know, we've built drums that look like the DeLorean 
with a flux <laughs> capacitor and doors that open on the side of the base drum. And yeah, that can definitely be seen as tacky or corny, but we always, we always pride ourselves in making it an actual drum set still. This thing can go on tour. It sounds sure. great. You can tune it up. We built a drum kit for a data remember that looked like acorns and it had no bottom head and they were literally sculpted from like an eight inch to at the bottom, to, you know, yeah. to a 12 inch diameter with big hoops on it that had, you know, fake acorn texture. Um, but the drum still sounded great. Um, oh, and it's a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. The cheeseburger for, for Max Sabbath. Like it's easy to make that sort of stuff and make it look cheesy, but we are, our builders here in Massachusetts are so talented and able to take those designs, that back of the napkin drawing that I had with the, with the artist, And they're able to turn that into a reality where it's like, Whoa, like that's a work of art that should go, you know, that should go either in a museum or like that, that drummer is going to have that forever. And they're going to stack it up in their house when they're done, when they're done touring with it. And that, that's really cool. And, and yeah, you know, every now and then we love, kind of flexing our muscles and, and building some really cool stuff that people just aren't going to expect, especially the, yeah. the nostalgic stuff. I love, I love taking something from, you know, the eighties or, you know, a TV show or we built a Mario uh, kit that yeah. the Mario yeah. tubes, like stuff like that. I love. That's awesome. What would be your number one favorite crazy custom wild kit that you've ever built? Oh man, um, they're all like they're all like little children to, to me, the guys that build them. So I can't I can't truly pick a favorite. But if if I were to have to say, yo, number one, this is my favorite design, and the the result is my favorite, it would have to be. And it's not even that crazy, but it would have to be the the first wood burn drum kit we built. It mm-hmm. was uh, it had tree like tree stumps and an owl wood badge, and it had a bunch of just car like line carvings to make it look like a like the the rings on a tree really nice walnut to like a golden ochre fade. I just love yeah. that kit. It was really the first drum set that that I saw in the drum world that was fully wood burned and it was beautiful. And Andy uh, Morotek, AKA the butcher, he played in a mm-hmm. band called the Academy is he yeah. came to our factory and wood burn that one. Um, and I did all the vertical lines on it. And it was just, I don't know, it was a time in the company that I was just like, I felt, so passionate about what we were doing and I was really feeling the momentum and it was just something really fun that I never thought we would do. And it just, again, turned out beautiful and it turned a lot of heads. Uh, we brought it to NAM and, um, people loved it. We ended up getting that one up to the drum center of Portsmouth up in New Hampshire and now a customer in Canada has it. So mm, that'd be my favorite awesome. for sure. Cool. Well, all right. So getting kind of back on a timeline here. So I think the last like date we mentioned was like, so things really picked up. You dropped out of school, you quit touring, you focused hundred percent on, um, SJC was like mid 2000 or, you know, the 2000s. So 2005, 2006, um, where do we go from there? And, and I also want to mention too, that we should talk about the, there was, and it's, it's pretty common knowledge that the boutique drum brand, um, I don't want to call it an explosion, but there was a lot of brands that were happening. Like I, I personally have a dark horse percussion kit that I got in 2005 or six because, um, Chris, uh, I always mess up his last name. Sagakis, Sagak from uh, RX bandits played it. Yeah. I was like, I have to have that. Um, and it was in that mid two thousands. There was a lot of brands in the boutique world around them. Right. For, I mean, there was, so w- what was that climate like then? Yeah, I I loved it. I thought it was really cool. The the the, the mid two thousands. Yeah, it was again that pop punk Vans Warp tour. Um, uh, you know, funky glitter lights and drums. Uh, it, yeah. it was a really cool time, and I loved it because being a fan of vintage drums and then being a fan of a lot of the boutique companies, it was a really cool competitive atmosphere where it was just like who, you know, it, it, there, it was good and bad. There was some certain business practices that I didn't agree with that were happening mm-hmm. from other companies. Uh, the newer ones that I think thought it was like, oh, you get the drummer from so-and-so to play your drums, give them a free kit. And it's like, boom, you're a business. Um, you know, there was some new yeah. companies that, that made it not so fun, but I thought it was just healthy competition and going to NAM again, it was really fun to, to try and see who was going to make the craziest drum at NAM or who would have the biggest line at their booth. Um, and, and it was just healthy competition and behind the scenes, we're all friends. Like I, we're, we're friends with all the other companies, um, that are out there. And 
I loved it. I, I loved seeing what people could come up with and what creativity, um, you know, and, and what drummers could come up with. It was really pushing the limits of, of drums as a, as a instrument. Yeah. I mean, and you're obviously a pretty humble guy, but I'll say it out of like shine, truth, dark horse, um, obviously SJC like you, I mean, you guys really kind of pushed your way through and were more or less, I would say if there was a competition, you would maybe be, you know, you could take the claim of being the, the winner of the <laughs> of working your way through the, the 2000s Thanks, man. and really coming out on top. I mean, they're all still great, but I'm sure. Um, but I feel like you guys sort of, I don't know. Um, you know what, though, man, I, I appreciate you saying that for sure. I mean, in, in at, where, where we are now, we're definitely busier um, than, than a lot of the competition, which is which is a good thing and something that I'm really proud of, but is also really hard to accomplish. And yeah, anybody totally. that builds drums and anybody that has a shop at home um, knows how difficult it is to do your 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 passion and want to make sure that the drummer that you're building it for is so stoked. But you know, every drum builder is a perfectionist and has some sort of OCD yep. about something. And it's really difficult to make all of those things connect. And then you add, you know, suppliers and uh, employees and taxes and all that stuff on top of it. It's really difficult. And the, the, one of the main reasons we were able to succeed in those early days, back to what we talked about at the beginning of this, was our connection and our hookup and our network that we had here at home, where we weren't paying rent for the first seven or eight years. My brother and I weren't mm -hmm. paying each other because it was like, we're just working other jobs to basically buy parts to do this. It's a hobby. And we had a we had a massive head start on a lot of the people that you just mentioned, um, and we had a massive head start on a lot of the brands that exist now. Where like we didn't have any expenses for the first say decade of the company, and that really gave us a footing to to build this amazing foundation that we can that we can really catapult ourselves off of. Yeah, and I also want to say that, like I said, I have a dark horse kit. I don't want to alienate anyone who has like a shine kit or a truth kit because like those are all amazing brands. So everyone who has those drums, you know, you should be proud because they're all they're all good drums. Um, oh. do, do you guys use um, so are you Keller shells, I would imagine? Yep. Yeah, we're majority Keller. Um, Keller makes a proprietary shell for us right now. Yep. That's what we call our M5. And uh, we've we've dabbled in making our own stuff. We we have some of the equipment to do it. You know, we wanted to really go full on and make our own shells. But gosh, what a what a what an additional business that would have been where we don't have the resources to really to really make it happen. So yeah, Keller, you know, and Keller's great. They've been doing it forever. Oh yeah. And um, again, yeah. with them making our proprietary shell, we're pretty confident in in our in our decision. And I would. I would recommend like always to people go check out the Keller episode because multiple times on the show, we have busted the myth of they're just a Keller shells company because oh, <laughs> that's so not true because we've talked about it multiple times where Keller makes proprietary shells for people. Like I've bought a Keller shell and I made a snare myself from like, um, drum supply house or whatever. It's totally different from Keller providing shells to companies. Um, like you guys. So Keller is awesome. Yeah. I love, I love reading stuff like that online. It's they're just cake decorators or they're just whatever. <laughs> like, dude, like I, okay. Like those people I'll never can, I, I'll probably never convince. I hope that our actions speak louder than words and they can just see that we're just, we're more than that, but it's, it's very difficult to be running and operating a business such as a custom drum company in the territory that we're in, you know, like the acoustic drum market is not growing, you know, electronic drums and other things are, are making our little niche market not expand rapidly um, to then start making your own shells as a very young company is hard, man. And I give props oh, yeah. to all of the companies that are doing it. You know, obviously DW makes their own shells. All the big guys do. I was really excited when CNC started, you know, pressing their own shells, Bill and, uh, the guys over there do an incredible job. It's just, it's a, it's a totally different business to run. And we were having a hard enough time operating, just building custom drums using Keller shells uh, to throw an entire new, uh, you know, process, not just one little step of a process. Like that's a big deal. Um, yeah. it, it was, it, it's a lot, man. I don't, I don't know when we'll, we'll get to that point. It's definitely a dream of ours to be there, but I can't have it take away from, from our core, uh, no. our core business. 
now. I mean, why fix what's not broken kind yeah. of thing? I mean, it's, yeah, it's and all working. The Keller, I appreciate you doing that Keller episode because I thought it was really cool. They've yeah. they've been the only company doing what they do, you know, uh, making drum shells for, for hobbyist drum builders like ourselves. Um, they've been doing it the longest and they're really great at wood and you know, oh, yeah. their, their drum shell part of their business is such a small part of their business. Like they're, they're wood know. experts, you know? Yeah. They, that was a major thing that again, we've talked about on the show, but like, I mean, they're, that is a tiny portion of a major company who is building, you know, they are, like you said, they're wood experts. Um, cool, man. So then, um, jumping forward, let's stick on a timeline here. So then going into like the 2010s, how did stuff go from there? I mean, that's, we just, uh, finished up that decade. Yep. What, what was that decade like in, in, in a retrospective? Yeah, I mean, the, the past decade's been, uh, exciting, fun, really hard and challenging. Like the early, like 2010 through 2015, we went through some massive growing pains, struggles, like really becoming a, a, a business where, we employed 20 people. We had an accountant full time. We were, you know, payroll and health insurance and taxes. And there was a recession, you know, right before that. And we weren't sure how we were going to, how we were going to handle it. We had just started doing NAM, which we were spending $50,000 to go to NAM to be a part of that. Even though we weren't really doing dealers, we were still direct to consumer. Um, we were really going through this time of like, okay, we, kind of for a little bit followed in the footpath of some of the other custom brands out there and we're doing what they were doing. But then we kind of quickly broke into our own in this uncharted territory where it was like the big companies haven't done this, you know, done 100% direct to consumer, um, you know, been building drums for some of the crazy bands like we were on, on Warp Tour and um, really pushing the limits on, on drum building and the craft. Um, it was, it was really hard, man. And I, I, I dealt with some tremendous stress, um, you know, not being able to pay bills and, and having um, a lot of expectations out there where social media was huge and people uh, thought we were this massive company where at that point we had, you know, had to do some layoffs and, and it was like, like a dozen people, everybody wearing 20 to 50 hats and running around like crazy trying to exceed expectations of our drummers and you know, hit deadlines. And it, it was really hard. My brother and I split up at that point, um, went through a really, really terrible um, family dynamic, um, really, you know, circling around the company. It was hard, man. It was like, uh, I, I, I would not want to go through it again, but I'm glad that I did do a lot of the things that um, I'm glad a lot of the things happened the way they did. Um, because it made me realize certain things over the past few years. And I'm so grateful for what I have now that SJC's kind of come out of that um, in full circle. Like I'm able to uh, be way more grateful for the things that we've got. And my family dynamic is a lot better um, because of that. So it, it was it was a tough decade for sure. But 2010 through 2020, um, we built some of the craziest stuff and we were really building that foundation of what SJC is now. Um, externally, it, it, uh, it was really cool, but internally it was extremely hard. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure working with family. I mean, you obviously love your family, but like, that's gotta be, I mean, there's gotta be something to that of like you, you, you almost can't get in fights with people the way you do with your family because you're so close to them that you're like, <laughs> you, yeah. you know, they're not yeah. going to let go. I see you can almost just like lose it in a certain way with your family. That you know, with yeah. Them. You lose Other it in a, in, a, in a split second and in a different way you would with anybody else. And, um, I hate that. Like, I'm so, I'm not proud of how I acted and the things that I had in my head and the way that I perceived certain things. But I was, a, you know, I still am a kid. I was, you know, it was, it was hard, man. My brother and I were so young, like mid twenties. And we had grown this company to a pretty sizable business with again, 20 or so employees. And there was a lot of pressure on him, my brother, Scott, there was a lot of pressure on me. And, um, I can't speak for him, but I definitely didn't, uh, respect and appreciate the things that he was doing for the business. I was just so concerned with my world in the business and being stressed about artists wanting you know, crazy drums in like a week. And I'm like, gosh, like, yeah, I want to say yes. And I'm going to say yes, because this is a huge opportunity. 
but here I am handing it over to my brother and he's just like, Oh my God, dude, what the, what the heck is going on? I, I can't do this in a week. And I'm like, well, I said, yes. Um, so you gotta do it. You, yeah. It's just like, kaboom, you fight. And then, you know, a lot of the employees were, were just buds from town or guys in my band that were working essentially for free. And so these little, uh, these little clicks were formed and it was like, well, we don't like Scott cause Scott's fighting with Mike. And I'm like, cool. These guys have my back and I'm a kid again. So I'm like, yeah, my brother, he's a jerk, whatever. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a lot worse than that. And I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of a lot of this stuff that went on, but we do, we, we fought like, cause we were kids. We were just little, little, <laughs> little boys, like teenagers, preteen yeah. making yeah. drums and like trying to be cooler than the other or like, <laughs> It was perfect harmony for so long and it worked and it built the business up because we had two uh, stubborn um, workaholics, you know, behind the, the driver's the, the driver's seat. But at, at a point it was enough is enough. And we took some time apart and I'm, I'm glad we did. Yeah. I mean, you know, at least it's all private and you didn't uh, air your grievances on national television. Um for oh. everyone to see. Yeah, you're right. Maybe <laughs> maybe we didn't do that. That was <laughs> No, I'm kidding. So we should talk about that. So you were on the sh- the TV show The Prophet, which I remember seeing it um on TV when it was live. I mean, this was what year was that? And that was 2015. That was right in the middle of this decade of uh yes. craziness. Yeah, so um for people who don't know, that's um I like the show. I mean, I I love those like kind of like businessy shows like that. So it's Marcus Lemonis, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and he, maybe you should describe what is, what is the, the, maybe the, you know, what is the premise of the show? Yeah. So it's, uh, the profit is Marcus is a, a wealthy businessman, very smart businessman. He owns camping world or he's, he's a, the CEO, I think of camping world and just a really huh. smart dude that, that, that made a lot of money in his career. And, uh, CNBC decided to have him host a TV show where he goes in kind of like bar rescue where he Mm -hmm. goes in and, um, fixes your business. He invests in the business. They really show all the dirty laundry of why your business has failed up until then. And he goes in and and gives his expertise and and a check to hopefully fix your business. And I, I'm, I was such a huge fan of that show and shark tank and bar rescue because being an entrepreneur, I loved watching, behind the scenes of what other entrepreneurs were doing, what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong, what these people implemented into their company that helped fix them. It was like, it's like, it's like, man, this is like going to college right here as I'm learning, Mm -hmm. learning like in real life. And so we applied to be on the show because as I mentioned in 20, 2010 to 2013 was, there was a lot of turmoil inside the company. Like, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Are we going to be a company? How are we going to sustain and that was right around when my brother and I were, were going our separate ways. And um, yeah, I applied to be on the show because I needed help. And I had, I, had, I had put a suit on far too many times and gone to the banks asking for a loan and asking them to believe in the company and having them all be like, your company is awesome and this sounds so cool and your business, your business presentation is the best we've ever seen, but we can't give you a loan because you have no history. We yeah. never had a history of having a loan. We never borrowed money before. So, you know, a decade into yeah. having a company without, without many assets, we didn't own a building. We didn't have a ton of equipment. You know, we're drum builders. We've got a bunch of inventory, some table saws and custom router tables that we built. You know, we didn't have a lot. And yeah. uh, so I was just like, screw it. I'm going to go and apply on the profitcasting.com. And I did. And boom, a month later, I'm on the phone with, with uh, the production company. And then I'm in LA at their office. And then a week later, they're at NAM filming us. Um, it all happened. Wow. It all happened really fast. And we were, I had a ton of plans. I used to drum tech for Rancid and, uh, I was supposed to go to Japan and all these tours with them. And CNBC was like, Nope, you can't go anywhere. Cause we're going to show up at your shop at any time in the next three or four months. Well, that was a wild experience. <laughs> There's so many things like about that show that are, um, it's, it's gotta be weird to have someone all, you know, all up in your business. <laughs> you like yeah. you, you almost feel like you can't be yourself, I guess, but you guys did a good job of like I feel like it just it represented drums if well, if that makes sense. It's like just getting drums on TV is like it's like the Ringo effect of like, you know, people see drums, people buy drum sets. It had to be good for your, you know, sales, I guess. It had to have a little boost of like, you know, it's free advertising in a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was cool. I I'm 
I'm very um, unfortunately jaded by the whole thing because of the fact that my brother and my my family dynamic and the family drama came out a little bit because you know they're they're making TV. It's reality. TV. They wanted to get some of that, and that's a that's a it's a great story to tell if you want people to watch it. But unfortunately, it kind of took away from the craft and what we were going through and and um, really trying to focus on growing the business and. Uh, like I said, I became a little bit jaded because um, people people took sides, and I'm you know I'm not mad that they did, but um, I got like hate mail. I got a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, wow, you know people are like you push your brother out and all this stuff, and it and it made it really difficult to um, to focus on the business because I was going through a lot of emotions internally with my family and things like that. I hate that people saw just 45 minutes of like, you know, at that point, 30 some odd years of our life together. Um, and it was, it was really difficult, but yeah, from a, from a business standpoint, it definitely helped, um, get eyes on the company and people appreciating how much work goes into it. Um, it definitely, it definitely got people thinking of SJC differently where up until that point, you know, 15 years of being a company and we had some pretty strong numbers on social media. People seemed to care what we were doing. So we were always delivering content. And when you deliver content on social media, of course, you're going to put out the best stuff. You're going to show mm-hmm. your best side. You're not going to post the photo of where you think you look ugly or where you have food in your team. No. Same for a business, right? And so yeah. up until that point, we're putting these videos out and I would I would go to shows and people are like, man, you must be a millionaire. And I'm like... <laughs> Like, dude, I own a custom drum company, man. Like there are points where I actually pay to be there. Like I have to like, you know what I mean? It's a labor of love. I'm not doing this for money. I never signed up to do this, to be uh, extremely wealthy. And I think being on national TV, showing people like, yo, yeah, I couldn't pay my bills that week. And I had a really hard time um, last year or, you know, in 2014, the year before that, we freaking lost money last year, man. Um, I think it gave people a better idea of like, okay, like I can't just ask SJC for a free kit every other month. And uh, I don't, you know, it it put things into perspective that that we work really hard for what we have and we hustle and we're scrappy. And part of me being scrappy was applying for the profit. And there are certain people that may have the mindset of you cheated, you got an investment of half a million dollars, whatever. But it's like, no, I gave up 50% of my company for that and earned the ability for that dude to like want to invest in the company. Um, so there's multiple ways of looking at it, but I'm I'm really excited we did it. It was an amazing learning experience. And at the end of it, yeah, we got a bunch of free publicity. Every time that commercial aired, it was like massive SJC logo on CNBC, which is pretty yeah. cool. Which then you become more of a household name to people who aren't drummers, who then maybe mom or dad wants to buy a drum set for their kid. And they say, well, what about SJC? I saw that on the TV. And it's like, you know, boom, totally. there, there you go. You and Scott, so like I, I actually went to rewatch it uh, a couple days ago. I and I, you, it's not on demand right now, but I can't remember the end. You and Scott, obviously, you're still both with the company, right? You guys reconciled, or how did they how made it? I forget how it ended too. I think we were both watching it, and it made it look like we reconciled. Like they got a handshake that was definitely not like a were good handshake, but they like slowed it down and made it look like a, (laughs) like a monumental, like we're good now. Um, Yeah. Hands connecting. What they showed on TV was definitely not like, this is good. Like when the cameras were down, like Marcus told the cameras to stop rolling because it was so awkward at times. Um, we didn't know we were, I didn't know my brother was going to be on it. He didn't know. They basically showed up at his house and like started (laughs) filming him. Um, so it was really weird for both of us, but to be honest, like we're really good now. And that was one of the, one of, it wasn't the thing, but it was one of the things that we were able to laugh about. Um, and, uh, like I said before, like, um, I'm just really grateful for a lot of the things we went through because it gives me such a different perspective of life and people and business and especially my brother and my family dynamic where, um, at, at a point pretty far after we were filming that, you know, this is still pretty recent that him and I have been hanging out, um, but, uh, yeah, we, we just were like, yeah. And then friggin' Marcus, and we would talk about that whole thing. And I was like, wait, I thought you meant this. And he'd be like, no, they friggin' did this. And I was like, holy yeah. shit. So we both kind of, uh, we both kind of laughed about it and, and truly, truly made amends afterwards. That's funny. It's like, I mean, it is based, it's, 
it's on a higher level, but it's reality TV, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I knew we were signing off for that. You know, I knew, I knew, and you got to know watching those shows, like you, it's easy to get sucked in, but you're like, you're watching an hour long show, which is really 37 minutes with commercials, you know, whatever that is. And they filmed over probably six months to a year and they're cutting oh down God. hundreds of hours of footage to the best 45 minutes of like, you know, gut wrenching yeah. or emotionally driven, uh, impactful TV. Yeah. But so now, and I should know this, but is Scott, are you guys, is it just you? Is Scott not with the company now? So it hasn't been made public and I'll say it here first, but yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's back in and he's kind of being staff watch right now where he's just like, dude, I just want to friggin' build drums. And, um, (laughs) yeah, we're trying not to make a big, big, big deal out of it, but I'm going to openly talk about it. Um, and it's, dude, it is it is effing awesome. It is like that's awesome. 20 years. And I feel like, I feel like we both know so much more now and we appreciate each other so much more now. And it, dude, it's so fun. It's what it should have always been. Um, and I'm so scared. Uh, no, I'm not scared. I'm like, I'm like, because I know how delicate and precious it is now. Like, uh, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if this would have worked this way when we were 20 years old, we have such a grander view of life now um, in business together. And it, it's just cool, man. Like my mom, like I said, is helping out. Um, it's just, it, it's put a lot more fun and a lot more passion back into it for me. Cause like I said, I got not just from the TV show, but I got jaded of just business, um, which is very easy to do as many of the hobbyists, uh, whatever you are, drum builders, whatever hobby turn into business. It's easy to suck the fun out of it, but it's been really cool, man. Yeah. I mean, but that's classic, uh, drum and cymbal stuff where two brothers work together and then they split apart i mean that's peisty that's zildjian i mean that's yeah. <laughs> uh that's you're you're keeping true with the tradition of drumming and and <laughs> yeah yeah and you know like like i said it's it's a it's a delicate thing and i think we both know and understand and respect that where it's just like for a family business to blow to to blow up not in a good way you know our our brand kind of blew up but then we blew up internally not in a good way um and split in such a tragic way and then it was aired on national tv um for a family business to go through that and then kind of come full circle and be um back you know that's why we're not talking about it a lot because we don't we don't want to um not necessarily we don't want to jinx it but we just we want to just kind of enjoy um, yeah, like definitely. just behind the scenes, like, yo, like we're not making a big deal out of this. Um, and it's just like, really, we're really lucky that we went through all that. And it's like, we're back together. Like we're back to where it started and where it should have, where it should be. Um, and I'm very thankful because a lot of family businesses don't get that opportunity. You know, you, you get too old, someone, you know, when you get older, someone gets sick or something happens or someone goes off and does another business and, we're, we're very lucky to be back together. Um, yeah, it's cool. Oh, it's your family. I mean, that's, I'm good friends with my brother who's a couple years older than me and I, I couldn't imagine, you know, I mean, that's awesome. Congrats. Mm-hmm. Um, now I want to talk about someone who has probably been, I'm assuming one of the biggest, um, just has to be a, a little bit of a boost for your business, which is, uh, Josh Dunn from, um, 21 pilots because I mean, man, he 21 pilots is a, such a massive band but that is like again it's the ringo effect where people see him playing it and god that has to be good for you know getting the name out there he he has yeah. done done good for your brand 100 percent, man and we didn't know it like a lot of the band mo- most of the bands that we work with um were the, the bigger ones were not big when we started working with them again back to panic at the disco and gym class heroes and all those bands that were that were massive back then we just started building drums from and we're like yeah this the drummer's cool the band's really cool we see some momentum and 21 pilots is was that it was like i met uh my buddy rico um i was hanging with rico he was drum teching for a band and we were talking and he was like hey this is band from ohio 21 pilots like they seem like they're gonna they're getting some traction like the drummer loves acrylic stuff and he wants to build his own drums, but you should, you should talk to him. And he linked us up and Josh and I talked and he was like, yeah, I was actually thinking about building my own kit. Um, but yeah, I've heard of SJC. Um, I actually have a kit I bought it on eBay. Let's, let's do it. And we built him a, a blue acrylic kit and it seemed like a month later they're on the MTV VMAs. They're just yeah. blowing up. They're massive. And Josh is one of those 
extremely charismatic guys behind the drums where he's super likable and he's soup. He plays with such enthusiasm and in such a, such a cool way. It makes you want to play the drums and their music is obviously really cool and catchy and they just, they hit it and they, they blew up and Josh Dunn has become a household name in drumming, which is so cool for him and for them and uh, for us to be a part of that and to, to really genuinely become friends and like drum partners with Josh before they were huge was really awesome because we have each other's backs in a different way now where it's like, yeah, dude, like we, we, you, you know, he knows we like him for him and not because he, his band is massive and he knows that I have his back no matter what. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah dude, we, we do a lot of Josh Dunn product. He's got a signature kit. He's got, he's had a few signature snares by now. Um, we've done a ton of practice pads and man, it's really cool to see like he's doing for, for, for modern drumming, you know, what Travis Barker did 15, 20 years ago. And Travis is still doing it. Obviously, that's not to say he's not still um, influencing, but Josh Dunn, um, it just reminds me, you know, because I was 13 watching Travis Barker being like, I got to do everything he does. I need to set my drums up the same way. And I see kids doing that. We sell, you know, we've sold thousands of practice pads um, to young up and coming drummers um, fans of the band that were like, I'm just going to get it because it's got a 21 Pilots logo. And then they get Josh's Zildjian stick and they're like, and I see him on Twitter doing a paradiddle. And it's like, that's so cool. Yeah. He's inspiring the next generation of drummers. And uh, what a cool dude as well. Like he's the, he's the raddest guy. Like he's so easy to yeah. work with and so supportive. Um, and it's, it's uh, we're really lucky to work with him. And I'm so, I'm so uh, proud of, of, of him and uh, just, just stoked that relationship that's awesome it's cool yeah i mean being an ohio guy it's cool they're from two hours where i uh from where i live and uh, a friend of mine um alex elkins he actually shot i think he was a camera operator but he worked on that stressed out video um where they're riding the big wheels which is now at like i think i'm looking at it's 2.1 billion views oh, on um, youtube and he shot another one with them which is really cool which i recommend for drummers it's 21 pilots i think if you type in Josh Dunn, Mute Math. It's basically uh, Darren King from Mute Math mixed with 21 Pilots. Um, and it's just a cool mix of two great drummers. Um, and he, Alex, shot that one as well. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, he did, or, or he, he did a great job. That the, the Mute Math video is phenomenally done. That was awesome. Yeah. Or he might have been DP, director of photography on that. Oh, but right. anyways, so um, this leads perfectly into the my probably one of the last questions here of so you guys went from being totally like custom house, um, you know, you call and you get, you know, you say you want your, I want my drums to look like a cheeseburger and you guys yeah. make it um, like Max Sabbath, who I've seen live, by the way, Max Sabbath oh, is rad. unbelievable. <laughs> and I recommend so cool. Max Sabbath to everyone. But um, you guys then went to like now Guitar Center, Sweetwater. Now you can just get a, get a, you know get a kit without custom ordering it. What was that process like going from custom to, um, you know, more stock drums? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, um, thank you for touching on that. I, I, I love yeah. this topic because it, it, it can be such a, a debatable thing. I'm very proud of how we've rolled everything out. You know, we early on in probably like 2007, my brother had the idea. He's like, Hey, let's make a series. Like, I'll just stand in the paint booth and you run drum shells into me one by one and uh -huh. we'll paint them and we'll do orange and red and green stains and we'll call it the tour series. And we did 10 cool. different tour series for the, you know, from 2007 to 2010 or whatever it was. And we always liked the, the idea of mass producing or mass assembly in our little custom way. It was able to gain some efficiencies. You make a little bit more money, you get more drums out there. Um, you grow the brand. That's the name of the game when you have a business. Grow the brand and do it in a way that you can, you know, stand behind. So we always had that kind of mentality. And then when we did the profit in 2015, um, you know, Marcus putting money in obviously allowed us to do certain things to our custom shop, but it also allowed us to open the door to, you know, other product lines. And Marcus was pushing the good, better, best series, and he wanted he wanted the good kit to be under a thousand bucks for an entry level drummer. And was really pushing us, you know, he, on the TV show, it showed us making a natural kit that we had as our good kit that we sold online uh, for, I think, like 1100 bucks or something. But it wasn't sustainable because it, we weren't making um, any money on it. Anybody that's building drums, even with, you know, the highest efficiencies um, after shipping and all that stuff, you know, shipping's included in that. You're only making, yeah. th there's slim margins on a lot of that stuff. So 
you know, we, we really wanted to get into the hardware business. And so we, um, I went over to Taiwan and visited some of the factories, um, to build some, some stands. We really wanted to do pedals and, and all that stuff. And, uh, when I was there, like we just had, we just saw some samples of the drums they built and these factories were, they were incredible. The, the, the few factories that I visited, um, throughout Taiwan, um, had extremely passionate, builders in there, like people that loved building drums. And some of these facilities were state of the art, like I'm not kidding, six floors with a, with an elevator that goes through and like a, a whole floor dedicated to lacquer drying and curing. And the, 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 the bottom floor was full of these amazing veneers and exotic woods that I had never seen. And I was just like, this is not what I expected. Um, no. you know, the, 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 the prejudice, I guess, of, 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 uh, Asian made, product in general, I think was just skewed. And I, I certainly yes. had a skewed vision of that. And I was extremely impressed with the people. I went out to lunch and dinner. I was there for a week and um, I went to, to lunch and dinner every day with these people. And what great people, like I'm, I'm lifelong friends with some of them now and I'm so lucky to have them in my life. And so we, we went in and we did, uh, we designed some drums. Uh, we call it our player's choice. We designed a few kits we were really um, conservative at first with like a walnut lacquer and a red lacquer. They did okay, but the whole time I was like, the SJC DNA isn't there. Like we need to really yeah. make something different if we're going to truly be proud of these drums that we're obviously trying to hit a certain price point. Um, we wanted to do stuff like signature kits with Josh from 21 Pilots that weren't 2,500 bucks, you know? Um, and so we, we reinvented a lot, came out with some fun colors, cyber yellow and Miami teal and just, mm -hmm. you know, eye catching colors that are within the SJC DNA. And, uh, we went very slow. We had just Sweetwater, um, carrying them. We had, you know, Alto music and drum flip, a couple small mom and pop shops. Um, and we just went really slow with it because I did not want it to take away from the experience of unboxing your SJC kit or being on our, our, our website or on uh, getting a post on social media or having us call you out. I really wanted to make sure that that customer interaction stayed um, intact. And what really helped was we started uh, a few years ago doing drum clinics uh, presented by Vans. And so it was in a really big way. We were able to have a crew of six or seven people come out and really put on a really cool show. Um, and we'd promote these products to the younger players at School of Rock or whatever it may be. Um, and yeah, dude, we're, we're actually, we're not in Guitar Center yet, but uh, this, this Thursday, oh, yeah, okay. uh, it, uh, this podcast is probably going to be out uh, past it, but in a few days, um, I'm, uh, I'm super excited. Um, we're, we're announcing that we're going to be in all the guitar centers of the, with those products. Oh, nice. We've, wow. held, we've held out on that for, you know, over a decade. I've, I've known the guitar center guys for a long time and we've, we've always, uh, never been confident in doing it because I didn't think that we'd be able to supply. I didn't want to put stuff out there and have it stutter step and take away from our core competency as a custom drum company. Um, but we've built the foundation now where we can supply it and we've got the right product. We've tested the market. And I think we can truly um, be one of the, the, the small custom drum companies that makes going into Guitar Center successful. And that coupled with our clinics that we do presented by Vans, when, when we're able to get out there again and, and people can, uh, can congregate in uh, you know, parties more than 10 people, um, yeah. we're certainly going to do some really cool stuff at guitar centers across the U S and I, I can't wait. That's awesome. I think you're smart to be, I guess, cautiously optimistic is a good word for it where you're like, you're not jumping into anything. So that's, that's awesome. I can't wait to, to see that. And, um, thanks man. And we're, we're lucky cause the, the GC team, um, gets it like, uh, they, they, I, they've known it. I've, I've always been really upfront in, in business and I've always just told them my fears and why we didn't do it. And they get it. So we're starting in like 20 store, maybe a dozen or 20 stores, a few SKUs. We're going to test it out in their market. We're going to, same like we always do. We're going to go get on top of it. When we started producing drums in Taiwan, I made a video, threw it up on YouTube. And I was just like, hey, SJC is, is producing drums in Taiwan now. Before anybody, you know, uh, uh, throws us under the rug or says that we're selling out, here's why and here's what it's going to look like. And I went to Taiwan and I visited the factories and everything that I just said um, to you I just was way up front with it. And I'm, I made the yeah. same video about GC and I'm, we're going to be very transparent in everything that we do. Um, Cause I know there can be some negative um, connotation associated with going with a big box store. Um, but yeah, sure. I, I feel, I feel very confident that we've, we've done the right steps and uh, 
we're going to open it up slowly and I th- and keep it sustainable. So I'm stoked. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a good, the, the flip side of looking at it is now you're giving the, you're giving a young kid who cannot afford a, you know, a pro drum set is typically $2,000, 3000 A kid can't afford that, but he loves Josh Dunn and he wants to play like his hero. So now he can actually go save his money, work all summer and buy a drum set that his hero uses. Um, and that's sort of a, you know, Disney movie version of it where the yeah. kid is working and buying it. But it's it's cool and it makes it more accessible. And I would say also that I think the Keller Shells thing and the Taiwan, um, you know, it's lesser in quality. Ron Danette really set me straight on that on an episode where he said, no, 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 it's not lesser quality. I've been there. I've been to the factories. And you're saying the same thing where it's like these are high quality drums. Um, it's It's not a, you know it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's just making it so it's more, you can, they can do this side of the business for you while you keep focusing on your, you know, core competency. Um, so totally I'm that stigma is being, being broken a little bit, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, we're, we're, we, we're, we're walking in paths that haven't been walked before where, you know, we've been direct consumer bringing Sweetwater in. They were a little bit hesitant, like, Hey, you guys are going to still sell direct. It's like, yeah, you know, we, that's our core business. We have to be able to take take orders directly. Um, we're, we'll certainly be fair and 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 not take business away from you. But if a kid calls us um, and hasn't you know talked to Sweetwater or been to GC, you know we we have to be able to continue to do that. And we've um, everybody's you know everybody's aware of it, and it's it's different. Every other business has been like, yo, we're in Guitar Center and we do all the brick and mortar stores, and we don't even we don't even have an e commerce platform. We don't sell direct, so. We've yeah. done things a little bit differently and we're lucky that people, uh, the people at Guitar Center and Sweetwater and all the dealers I mentioned still support us. Um, but, you know, we, we're going into uncharted territory. We don't know what it's going to look like, but we care uh, about the business a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, obsessive over it. So I'm going to make sure nothing, uh, nothing happens. And if it goes off the tracks a little bit, which, which is bound to happen, this is life and business. Mistakes happen and things happen. I'm, I'm prepared to set it back on the, on the tracks immediately. Yeah. Good, good. It's good to be, you know, obsessive over things in a good way. And yeah, that is uncharted territory where you're, you're selling and then there's a distributor because you're usually from what I've learned through the show is that's a, that's a, like a, Oh no, 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 no. We're doing the distribution. You better not be selling behind our back kind of thing. Um, So, so yeah, you're, you're changing the game there. Um, awesome. Mike, well, I think, um, Oh, I want to, as we wrap up here, so my experience, I have played uh, my friend Aaron Roy's SJC kit. We did like, he did a video series for a while where we would try beers and then play on his drums. And he has, I think, one or two SJC kits and um, and we'd play kind of bass drum to bass drum. And um, I'll try and when, I, when this comes out, I'll share that video. Um, but um, awesome drums, very high quality just like you hold them and they feel, you know, I mean, everyone who listens knows that feeling if you pick up a drum and it feels right, it just feels solid. It feels well built. Um, and, and SJC is definitely that. So I'm, that was my first experience and I was like blown away. That's Um, awesome. Thanks man. And thanks Aaron, Aaron Roy, the drummer. Thanks for uh, showing (laughs) Bart your kit. And yeah, I appreciate (laughs) you seeing that, man. Yeah. You can definitely tell quality when you, uh, when you, when you pick it up and, um, we've, we've always been proud of that. We, we use the highest quality components and, uh, we're obsessive, man. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's a labor of love and the people building the drums at SJC are, are, uh, are as obsessed as I am. So it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Last question. So you're obviously like the king of the like modern, again, I don't want to say new school. Cause it seems like, I don't know, that's not, it's a good thing. You're the king of like the new school, very cool um, drums. Do you yourself, do you have any like vintage drums? Do you have like a little, like a, you know, a drum collection? What's your, you know, dude, your vintage I, know. Drums I, drum? I, uh, I recently, so yeah, I know I don't, I wish I did a couple of years ago. Um, when we, when, when Trey cool came on to SJC, he's a huge vintage guy. Oh, yeah. duh. Here's another one. Yeah. You got a collection man of like some incredible vintage kits. And I'm like, I want to do that. Like I want to, I want to start collecting. Um, yeah. I would love to have a Canon top hat kit. Those mm-hmm. go for a lot of money. 
Um, just had a, just had a baby a few years ago. So, uh, my wife yeah. would not be stoked if I spent 10 grand on a, on a, <laughs> on a three piece no. jacket. Uh, I saw one at Chicago uh, drum exchange a few years ago, but, um, yeah. that, that's my dream to have a, have a cannon top hat kit. And I, I'd love to have a few snare drums. Um, you know, the, the, the old school Rogers stuff or, you know, I, I just, I yeah. never, I've never really allowed myself to, um, I'm not a collector of, of, of really anything, but very recently I'm like kind of starting my dream board of what I would, what I would want to get, um, someday. That's awesome. I talked to Don Bennett from Don's drum, Don Bennett drum vault the other day. And he, we were talking about the top hat and cane kit and he said he's had easily 10 of them come through his hands. And I think he has three of them right now. So, um, that's awesome. He's your, he's your guy. Um, and also I have a one year old, so I feel your pain on, uh, everything <laughs> for you goes completely, uh, you're in the back seat, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, you know what, dude? Like, I love it, man. My 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 yeah. is three and a half now, and uh, congrats on having a one year old, man. I'm sure you're thank you. You're loving it. I hope. Um, oh yeah, it's so fun. It's it's the best. So yeah, now I'm like, you know, I I, I just I, I've never had a hobby, man. Like, I, it was just drums and building drums my whole life and playing drums. Um, and I recently got into mountain biking, so I go and cool. I cruise with my son, and I just you know, he's only three and a half, but as, as we keep doing this, I'm like, I have all these grand visions of like, all right, I'm going to get him a mountain bike. I'm going to buy a truck and I'm going to do all this. So I think that's going to be my hobby before I start cool. liking vintage drums. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Cause like, like I literally was thinking the other day, I was like, man, I need to get it. Like we both are drummers. We both do stuff with drums, but I was thinking I need to get a different hobby <laughs> or I need to get a hobby. And I'm like, to most people, what we do is a hobby, but it's not when you're doing it a lot. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, dude, when it takes, you know, uh, 80 hours a year a week, you know, to, to, yeah. to, to feel accomplished um, or to feel for like sure. you're not maybe buried come Monday morning. Um, for sure. Definitely. <laughs> Cool. So, um, again, I want to thank, um, Nick Angelini, um, from whale city percussion. I think I said whale city drums before whale city percussion, um, uh, for getting us connected. Um, thank you, Nick. and yeah, so everyone, uh, Mike, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? I'm sure it's pretty easy, but I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thanks Bart. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, hope you, hope you enjoyed in, uh, yeah, for real, Nick, thanks for, thanks for all your support all these years, man. And thanks for connecting, connecting us. And, uh, being just a rad dude and playing in one of the coolest punk bands ever. Um, yeah, people can find us on sjcdrums.com. That's our website. Pretty cool historical timeline and some videos and tons of photos of all the custom drums we build uh, or Instagram at sjcdrums. We post content every day. We love posting uh, about our drummers and uh, uh, reposting, you know, some some cool cool stuff. So hope you hope you enjoy and really appreciate uh, the time. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Mike. This has been uh, this has been a real pleasure to, for, to have you as my my first kind of like modern uh, drum builder. You're doing a great job and, and keep it up, man. I really appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound podcast. <laughs>